So here's, you know, it's kind of this apocalyptic title, but Managing Data About Data Management uh, is the title. And uh, yeah, thank you again for giving me the opportunity to speak and I, I jump ship on this. So my overview, I'm going to tell you about a little bit about the project that I've been doing now finishing, you know, four years. Uh, we'll be finishing up in June uh, officially, but the publication goes on forever. What our challenges with actually dealing with the data have been, and then um, some of the other contextual issues around it. So the project has been um, on social science data archives. Uh, ISTA was actually a kind of a pilot for this project. And Orla mentioned getting data from the UK DA. It's one of our actual case sites. So it goes around, comes around here. So the project started in 2014 with a small pot of funding I got from uh, Association for Information Science and Technology, which I parlayed into an IRC New Foundations grant, which we then parlayed into a much larger grant with the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. And that ends in June today. And we were developing a history of social science data archives, because what they have done, social science data archives predate the internet. They've been around at least since the 60s, potentially their antecedents even in the 20s. They've been sort of quietly collecting the kind of data that several people here have been talking about, things like administrative data from the government, health data, um, census data, uh, a lot of the stuff that Orla was talking about, stuff that ISTA does. These institutions have existed well before we started talking about e-science, e-social science, and the like. And my collaborator, who's um, introduced via you know another slide, she and I started talking years ago about, well, what makes these institutions last? How have these institutions that have had to deal with going from microfilms and punch cards to uh, standalone computers to the internet actually functioned for all, you know, 50, 60 years um, and stay open when so many contemporary information infrastructures have essentially collapsed? So these are some of the things that we have been studying um, we're looking at funding, we're looking at business models, we're looking at the technology and the relationships and stakeholder relations. All of the sort of, frankly, kind of boring, nitty gritty stuff that's underneath everything else. Um, my colleague likes to describe us as the Botswana of research. We are small, peaceful, quiet, and we get the job done. Okay, that's it. So, but this is the underlying stuff. So we have been funded most recently by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. My colleagues at University of Wisconsin, she's part, gotten some funding from them. Um, I got funding, obviously, on this side of the house from our uh, pond from IRC as well. And Kristen is my co-PI and partner in crime. So we have a, a shadow co-PI who never does or says anything. So he's on the grant officially, but doesn't ask us for anything and doesn't give us anything. So Greg is just kind of there. Um, we have worked with about four to six students, a little bit here, a little bit, a few here um, on various independent studies, mostly at Wisconsin where the funding is. Um, and currently one of them has finished her PhD and is kind of now a collaborator. She's got a lectureship at a different university. So we've had a bit of, I'm giving you the context because you can sort of see what we're trying to do here, sharing this data, even in a very small team, with a bit of a rotating cast of characters. By the way, our logo for the project came from one of the archives we studied. Um, they let us use this with the permission. It's from uh, ICPSR in Michigan. So this is our project logo. Um, so what do we actually collect? As I said, we're basically interested in all of these social science data archives. Uh, it's varied. We've got two big cases and a couple of smaller cases, as well as contextual organizations. So we have collected documents from ICPSR in Michigan, UKDA in Essex, um, ISDA. Uh, we also have data from SESTA, which is the Council of European Social Science Data Archives. They just, just spent a lot of money on getting their um, organizational documents. What is it we're talking about? We're talking about budgets, memos, administrative documents, um, letters, y you name it, all the stuff. Some of it's actually in archives, a lot of it's not. We have actually gone to these sites, sat around with iPads and photographed things, and then our poor research assistants stitch these documents into documents for us. So if like six pages of a letter suddenly turn into one. We also have interviewed staff and former staff and directors at many of these organizations. Uh, and also people give us stuff, random stuff. So that's our data. Uh, what are the formats we have to contend with? A lot of it's born digital. Um, but because we're doing all these photographs and stitching together, we've got JPEGs that then get stitched together. 
um, as well. We have spreadsheets because we look at budgetary documents over time. Um, a lot of it's digitized papers, cards, notes, etc., and the audio sound files for the interviews. So pretty limited in format, okay, and even sort of in variety. I should mention one other data format. We're also interested in the evolution of this concept of longevity and sustainability. So we actually have gotten publications, peer-reviewed publications and reports that have also formed part of a data set because we're doing content analysis and we just got an article accepted to try and define sustainability over time in the library and information science literature. So here were our project needs. Now remember, both of us are information scientists who supposedly do this for a living, and this was still a struggle. We have, it doesn't look like a lot of data, but we have massive metadata and annotation needs because we're doing qualitative and content analysis coding, and it'd be nice to do it in the document, but it's gotta be somewhere. Uh, we need to be search, that stuff has to be searchable, not just the annotations and the text. Text has been less searchable. Uh, she works on a Mac, a PC, I work on a Mac. She's in Wisconsin, six hours behind me here in Dublin, so I get to live in the future. Uh, rotating project staff, by which we mean our research assistants, so things have to be, students have to be able to be brought up pretty quickly um, to speed, to work with us. Uh, we share in real time, we work in real time. Um, we have security needs for interview data. And we also like to store the other documents, the grant documents, the ethics documents, our outputs. I remember I mentioned the peer-reviewed publications. And it'd be nice if we could do all of this and not do it too expensively. Um, we did have funding for software, uh, to purchase software, but you still don't want to spend thousands and thousands of euros, dollars, take your favorite currency. So we came up with an imperfect, imperfect solution, Mendeley. Mendeley is a, um, it is used for citation management. We tried qualitative analysis software, several varieties. The one we first, we actually really liked that was letting us do this was Deduce. The problem with Deduce is that in its initial phases, it wouldn't let us um, import PDFs. And the, like 90% of our documents were in you know, PDF. We talked to the Deduce developers, they kept saying any day now, and by the time you get around to it, it was too late. And this is a very important lesson in project data management, is the right solution may come along, but you're you know, sort of technologically determined by what you started with. Um, so what we've done with Mendeley, and I've sort of kept it fuzzy, is remember, we're information scientists. We created upfront categories. Each of our archives, or like the, that we study, each of our societies has a folder um, and the documents of UKDA. Then we have DDI Lit Review, that's a publication we're working on. ICPSR, 1962 to 89. And then we divided that up into um, et cetera, et cetera. Irish infrastructure, and, you know, that's all good. Um, so you can see what we're doing. In the middle is the list of documents by year. That's our code, that's our document naming scheme. We came up with that up front. Um, and then the notes that we actually take or our students take go in the general notes. This is not a great solution. It really is not a qualitative data analysis program. Okay. Second thing we have to use is box.com. University of Wisconsin mandated this because it has a higher level of security than Google Drive, et cetera. Note bene, UCD does, still does not have a good solution for us. I have no good place to keep secure information that I need readily accessible. Wisconsin makes us use this. I actually had to go through their human ethics test twice because they do a um, refresher as well to be able to do this. But I had to get an account and so forth and so on. So all of our project docs go into this and that's where the, um, the native data sit, all of those secondary documents. We also use Google Drive or Google Docs for collaborative writing. Okay. So, um, we have a problem with secondary data use because all of our data is secondary. These are organizational docs. These are not our docs. We really can't share this because they belong to ICPSR. They belong to ISTA, you know, same sort of thing, not even a gray area. Um, because we have no one platform, it's very easy for things to go slightly awry. Um, where did we put that publication? that we finished, where did I put these conference do, you know, documents? And remember, we're trained information scientists. If we can't get this right, who can? Um, so we have some version control issues as a result of this. And um, none of these things talk to each other. 
Like I got to, you know, log in, log out. Mendeley, you know, we got a desktop version that syncs with the um, other version. We've had problems with it. It costs us 600 euro a year to, you know, deal with this. Another thing, of course, is that I'm working with an American colleague, which means we have different regulatory schemes around data protection. She wants to archive the data. Um, no. Or there's things that I require she can't do. And remember, as I said, I've got to go through their ethics. They actually have more stringent human ethics than we do. So kind of had to go through two universities. And it was actually even, this is weird to me. It was almost like UCD said, we will give you permission to do this research as long as Wisconsin did. And Wisconsin was like, well, we'll give you permission as long as UCD does. So we had to get ourselves out of that catch-22. Um, and on that crabby note, I guess I can sort of finish up here, which is to say that this has been actually, it was really worthwhile because we did actually sit down up front, think about things like the data dictionary, naming scheme. We didn't know what kind of data we were necessarily going to get, but we had to go through a lot of trial and error. And I actually teach research data management not to researchers, even though I could, but as a, you know, as a professional practice. And this is what I tell my students. You've got to work with researchers up front to figure out, do they have a sensible naming scheme? Um, even, you know, so, you know, something's better than nothing, always. So, you, and we've done tweaks over four years. And we have to train our new research assistants. But ultimately, it has kept us generally organized over time. Thank you.